This sample explores various methods of using short row shaping or partial knitting to achieve various elements within the work. Short row shaping can be used to create different knit structures, textures, etc., but is most commonly used to shape neckline, shoulder slopes, etc. There is another video that specifically speaks to short row shaping as a, a principal element of machine knitting, and I'll put a link to the video uh, below. But for the most part, this is a supplement to the sample that we've worked in class so that you have another record for it. In preparation for working the curved edge, I've cast on and knit three rows. The carriage is on the left. I'm going to begin by isolating needles in the center of the work that will be the lowest point of the curved hem. And to do this, I need to get the working yarn into the center. So I've held needles right 5 to right 15, and then I'll hold left 5 to left 15. So as I work from the middle out, I'm going to progressively add rows into the center. So to prevent an eyelet, I'm gonna wrap the needle on the carriage side and then return the needle opposite the carriage side to work and continue working in this way until I've got four needles left in work on either side. If I don't wrap the needles on the carriage side of the work, when I knit back, uh, an eyelet will form. So wrapping will help to prevent this. And we'll speak a little bit more about this as we work our way up the sample. But what's happening is that I'm progressively increasing the length and the width as I put additional needles into work as I knit back and forth. When I have four needles left in work, on both sides of the machine. I'll wrap the last needle as I normally would have, but then I'll return all four needles to work on the opposite side of the carriage. This will level off the curve a bit and give me that shirt tail effect. I can do the same on the opposite side, and you can see here a bit how that curve has taken shape. I'll knit a couple rows to separate this sample from the next, and then we'll work the more traditional short row shaping. So here in short row shaping, we're basically knitting in a wedge that's going to change direction in the knit. So when we work short row shaping, we're going to hold multiple needles opposite the side of the carriage. So here I've held five on the left, I've knit across and it's skipped those last five. To prevent an eyelet, I'll wrap the last needle held before I knit back across to the right. With the carriage on the right, I can hold groups of needles on the left, so I'll select another five, knit across, wrap the last needle, and knit back. I'll repeat this across the whole width of the knitting, working in groups of five stitches at a time. It's a bit hard to see with the needles in hold, but the right hand side of the knitting has more length than the left, and this is what's creating that wedge shape. So if I set the carriage back to N, I can knit across, and all the needles will knit, even if they're in hold, doesn't matter. So here you can see a little bit better that the right hand side is much longer than the left. This is because we've progressively held needles on the left, which has shortened the row widthwise and therefore built in less length on the left than on the right. I'm going to repeat this process, but in the reverse direction. And this time, instead of wrapping the needle before I knit back, I'll do nothing. And this will create a small eyelet at each group that I've held. So still holding needles opposite the carriage side, 
the two rows. Here's the eyelet that will form. It'll be more apparent when I've got more length on the machine. Hold another group of five, knit two rows, and so on. After I've knit a few rows just to get uh, access to this on the machine, you can see those eyelets that have been formed that otherwise would have been prevented had I wrapped the needle. So these are the two kind of basic methods of short row shaping. We can use short row shaping to isolate groups of knitting. And in this example, I'm pulling everything opposite the carriage to hold with the exception of the five needles on the carriage side of the work. I'll knit four rows so that the carriage is returned to the right hand side. And then I'll bridge in the fifth row to the next section of needles by drawing those back to work knitting the fifth row and then returning those five that I've started with back to hold. This bridged row is also the first row of four before the next bridge to occur across the new set of needles. So counting this first row, I'll knit three more. One, two, three. This brings me to four. And then I'll bridge again in the fifth row, which will be the first row in the new group but the last row in the existing group. So I haven't broken the yarn. There's gonna be a float in between all of these open sections. And to avoid the float, you have to break the yarn and knit each portion with its own end. So here I've knit a couple more rows on this next group of knitting that's been isolated and I'll cut the yarn so that I can create a, a vertical buttonhole without the float. So I'll return everything to hold, and I need to get the working yarn, in this instance, to the immediate right of that next group of needles. So I'll insert the yarn where I want it to pick up knitting when I push these needles back into forward work, and knit five rows. So this time I'm knitting the full five instead of bridging in the fifth row because I'm using a separate end each time. So after I knit this fifth row, I'm going to repeat that same process, pull everybody to hold, and move to the next group with a new end of yarn. So here you can see on the right, I've got those floats appearing and the remainder are open. They look a little bit stretched out, which they are on the needle bed, but once we've taken them off and blocked them, they'll shrink up a bit. The tough part would then be weaving in all of these ends, which takes a bit of time, but is the option here to avoid the float in the buttonhole. So the next sample that will work is a, a variation on this to a degree, um, but because of the way that certain groups of needles are isolated and then knit in succession, it's going to create some interesting kind of wave-like patterns and this open lace work effect. So to set this up though, we need to put a few needles out of work to allow some runs or ladders to form. So I'm going to isolate groups of four needles or four stitches and on the fifth stitch I'm going to transfer it to its neighbor and then put that needle out of work so a run will form. The first step is to isolate just the group of needles closest to the carriage. I'm going to pull everybody else to hold and with this last group the only one being in work I'm going to knit six rows.
and on the seventh row, I'll bridge to the next section. I'm not going to return, though, the first group into hold. I'll knit five more rows to make six. And then bridge to the third. And this time, before I continue knitting, I'll pull the first group into hold. I'm going to continue working in this same way across essentially two groups at a time with the exception of that one row where I bridge to the next and then immediately hold that what becomes the third group. So because I'm knitting across two sections at once, uh, those floats are going to draw up the adjacent section and make this wave-like effect. The point here for this sample, and I'm sorry it keeps going in and out of autofocus, I can't seem to figure out how to adjust that, um, is for you to understand how you can move the working yarn through this technique of bridging kind of back and forth. So you can certainly use this uh, experience as an opportunity to iterate new knit structures using this hold method, um, which I would certainly encourage you to do. So here I've made a mistake and I failed to put that last group of stitches into work before I knit across and I've got a float on top. So to rectify this easily, I'm going to just manually knit those needles back to get the working yarn to where I need it to be. So here you can kind of see how those successive groups of needles are knit together uh, form this wavy lace-like effect utilizing those floats. So I'm going to put all the needles back into work and knit a few rows in preparation for the next sample just to get everybody knitting again. This next sample is how to work bobbles or raised bits of texture on the knit side of the work. I'm making these in a bit of a random spot, but in class we've made them more uniformly. So the first step is to hold needles opposite the side of the carriage to get the working yarn into that group of three needles that we'll work this extra length into. And I find it easy to put a little bit of downward pressure with the transfer tool by pushing it through the three stitches directly below the loops on those needles that'll knit and then knit four rows. You can then pick up those four stitches that you've grabbed with the transfer tool, which is much easier said than done, and hang them back on those same needles to trap that bit of extra length uh, together. And then we'll bridge across to the next instance of the bobble, depending on uh, the effect that you're going for in your pattern. So I've bridged across, I'll hold everything to the right with the exception of the needles that I want to create the bobble across and then repeat all of these steps again. You can work this same effect without rehanging those initial stitches or in this instance the stitch from the row below, uh, but the bobble might not be as pronounced where that arch of excess length will just kind of float across the top of the knitting. 
experiment, see what might work best for you. After those stitches are hung, bridge out of the entire row by pushing everything to the left, in this instance, back to forward work. I can then cancel hold on the carriage and knit a couple rows. I'll repeat this again in the center of the work. It doesn't look like much from the knit side, but it has trapped those extra rows in a clustered bit right on the front. In this next sample, I'm going to work several long lengths of isolated needles, this time in groups of three, working across the needle bed using the bridging method. This will carry a large float between groups, but in some instances it, it may not matter. So once I work across the entirety of this particular width of knitting, I can then cross these groups as I would a cable normally to create some interesting open work effects. This last sample uh, works a neckline edge using the short row or, or partial knitting method. So instead of decreasing to create the shaping, we'll put needles into hold. I have to divide and knit the neckline. So I'm gonna start on the carriage side and I'm gonna bring everything to the left of zero out plus three additional needles on the right hand side. These center six needles indicate center front or that flat bit of the neckline edge. I'll knit one row and wrap the last needle held before I knit back to prevent an eyelet. And now I'm gonna start decreasing. So I'm gonna pull a needle opposite the carriage to hold position when the carriage is on the right and knit two rows, remembering to wrap in between to prevent an eyelet. I'll keep working these short row decreases until only eight needles remain in work. At that point, I'm gonna knit up the side neck and knit straight without wrapping for eight rows. After that eighth row, I'll bind off what in the sample will serve as a reference for the shoulder seam. Once I've bound off the right shoulder, I can free pass to the left since everyone's in hold and the carriage is set to hold. And then I'm gonna work the neckline shaping on the left side as well. So I'll return all of the needles to forward working position with the exception of left three 
all the way to whatever is remaining towards the right hand side. Remember those center six stitches, left three through right three, indicate that flat bit at center front in the neckline edge. So decrease with the short row shaping method, remembering to wrap at each instance, and then knit eight rows up the side neck. You can bind off those remaining eight stitches as well. At this point, the center front and all of the initial shaping for the bottom of the neckline curve remain on the machine. All that's left to hang to complete this neckline is that straight bit of the side neck that we've knit. Stretch the side neck slightly and hang each row one stitch in from the edge. Make sure that you're hanging the left and the right side across the same number of needles. It's important here to make sure that you're only picking up that last column of stitches, keeping in mind the three to four or two to three pickup ratio, because at this point we're hanging rows to stitches. After everything's hung back on the machine, we're gonna knit four or five or six rows, preferably at a little bit of a tighter tension to create a single band that will roll or curl in tightly. After you've knit about five or six rows, bind off using any method. 